Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Vladislav Tominski. I'm pleased to welcome you uh, to the last IUSD lecture in 2020, titled The Forum Imperative by Professor Dr. Nirmal Kishnani. I'm happy to highlight that today's lecture is organized in cooperation with the State Academy of Fine Arts in Stuttgart, ABK, Climate Responsive Design by Professor Matthias Rudolf. Moreover, this winter semester, we are happy to cooperate with the uh, Connection School, Ukraine and the Netherlands, whose audience is warmly invited to attend the ISD lectures. Let me uh, also begin with a few formalities, informing you that our today's event has been recorded. And also, please make sure that your cameras uh, is, uh, are turned uh, off and the mics are muted during the presentation. It will allow us to have a better quality record. Uh, also, while people are still uh, entering our virtual meeting space, let me briefly outline today's agenda. So, after the introduction, I will be happy to pass the word to our today's speaker, Nimal, who is an associate professor with the Department of Architecture, National University of Singapore, and is program director of the Master of Science Integrated Sustainable Design. Uh, Nimal is also uh, editor in chief of Future Arc magazine and uh, resident jury chair of the Future Arc Prize and Future Arc Green Leadership Award. Since 2002, he has been an active part of the sustainability conversation in Asia, advising on projects and influencing policies that shape design practice. Uh, also, he's an author of several books, including uh, his latest one, Acupuncture, Transforming Architecture and Urbanism in Asia, which offers a uh, prism on systems thinking and uh, regenerative design. Uh, the lecture will be followed by a half uh, hour discussion session, kindly moderated by Pro uh, Professor Matthias Rudolf. It's a perfect moment now to mention that you are uh, uh, kindly invited to participate in the Q&A session by writing your questions to our WebEx chat during the lecture. We'll collect them and then post to our speaker. Right, so uh, I think it's more or less it from my side at the moment. So, Matthias, if you don't have anything to add, I think we could uh, pass the word to Nimal for his lecture. Great. Um, let me screen share, because uh, that's always the tricky part. Hang on. Yeah. Yes. Seems to be taking its time. <clears throat> Hola. Can you see that? Everything okay? Yes, it works. All right, great. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for that introduction and the invitation to speak. I um, I, I start with a uh, a small confession. Um, uh, for a long time, I have uh, believed that form, as it is produced by architects and planners, has been an obstacle to the current planetary crisis. Many designers, <clears throat> uh, and I'm sure you know a few, Discuss form mostly as objects with formal qualities, a position that I uh, believe is often <clears throat> at the expense of certain outcomes that are important today. Um, there is little or no discussion of the significance of either architectural typologies or urban morphologies in the search for sustainable solutions. I now believe that the opposite is also true. Uh, form can be a part of the solution and for this to happen, we must get past seeing uh, buildings as objects to seeing them as a kind of a structure of relationship. A building is a system that is embedded within a bigger system. And here, form actually facilitates the flows and exchanges between elements and across scales. In the 19th century, long before the modern movement was born, there was already a debate on the relationship of form and function. Interestingly, um, this was in the natural sciences. Uh, some biologists believed that there was an inner logic that determined the form of an organism, what, what one might call uh, programming or DNA. Others thought that form was the result of the organism's adaptive response to the environment. This form versus function argument started in the sciences, but eventually would find its way to architecture. So, of course, we know of Lewis Sullivan, the American architect, who is credited with that famous uh, phrase, form follows function. And he said this towards the end of the 19th century. It is very likely that he was influenced by the ongoing debate in the sciences. I just, I, I want to take a look at the full quote just to see where he was coming from. 
This is what he said. He said, all things in nature have a shape. That is to say a form, an outward semblance that tells us what they are, that distinguishes them from ourselves and from each other. In nature, these shapes express the inner life. They are so characteristic, so recognizable that we simply say it is natural to be so. So whether it is the sweeping eagle in his flight or the open apple blossom, form ever follows function, and this is the law. Now here Sullivan implicitly was talking about wholeness of form, that form is something more than the sum of parts. And this principle of wholeness, especially in its relationship to nature, would disappear from the architectural discourse for much of the 20th century. This is not to say that we have abandoned nature as an inspiration. Today, nature-like forms are seen in the works of many leading architects. Here is a proposal uh, for a neighborhood in Moscow by Zaha Hadid Architects. Here is something closer to my home, Reflections at Keppel Bay in Singapore by Daniel Libiskin. In both examples, what we see here is a kind of organic formalism, a mimicry of natural geometries. There are others who use uh, nature as a kind of an artifice. Uh, the buildings of Stefano Boeri, for instance, are intensely vegetated and deeply biophilic. Form here is a scaffold for greenery, and the building has the appearance of a living organism. And while some architects embrace formalism and others seek biophilic design, there are very few urbanists and planners that look to patterns in nature. This is a proposal for the Amravati Master Plan in India by Foster and Partners. Here, the city is orthogonal uh, and rigid. The center appears to be the seat of power emphasized by a very strong symmetry. And around this center are the different functions of the city expressed as zones. The morphology of this Indian city is rooted in modernist principles of planning. On the right, we see Le Cabousier's contemporary city for 3 million inhabitants which was presented first in 1922. We see the same kind of hard edge zoning with very strong, uncompromising geometry. And each zone uh, in the plan has its own three-dimensional building typologies. Both master plans conceived about 100 years apart uh, were argued on grounds of societal and environmental change. There are always a few exceptions to the rule. This is the master plan for Wu Lijie Eco City in China by Yu Kong Jian, a well known landscape architect and urbanist from Beijing. He argues what we call an ecological approach to planning. In this, networks of water and vegetation are the lines of forces that de decide how the human settlement is to be organized. Now, Kong Jian is one of a few urbanists today breaking free of the uh, 20th century modernist straitjacket. In this lecture on the form imperative, I'm going to talk about the work of three architects in tropical Asia, and I've selected them for a few reasons, apart from the fact that I, I know each of them personally. Well, the first reason is that each expresses an explicit position on form as an environmental trigger or a social agent or both. Second, they argue that a nature-based approach to design is key to sustainable built environments. And third, they expand the meaning of function to include engagement of systems beyond site boundaries. The first is uh, taking Soon. He's a pioneering Singapore architect who shaped the conversation on tropical architecture and cities back in the 70s and 80s. He's now retired from practice, but he continues as an adjunct professor at the National University of Singapore. He recently turned about 80. Ken Yang is one of the best known eco designers in practice. In the 80s, he argued for a bioclimatic approach to tropical high rise buildings. Today, he talks about an integration of the biological and the architectural. He is in his mid 70s. The third group is Richard Hassel and Wong Man Sum. They are two founding partners of the Singapore based design firm Woha. Their work integrates social and ecological layers in ways that they say are necessary to tackle climate change in mega cities. They are in their late 50s. I will organize their projects into five form imperatives, starting with form as an environmental filter. Now, this idea dates back to the 70s and 80s when we saw the first big energy crisis and uh, there was a lot of curiosity about how buildings could be designed in ways that would reduce energy demand. But around the same time, 
uh, there were many architects that were interested in regional identity. Uh, this was post-colonial Singapore, Malaysia, and the question of who we are as a society and how our architecture represents that took the form of climatic design. So taking soon, for example, talked about three principles of form uh, for tropicality. The first was the dominance of the roof. The second was the idea of the, the porous, the fuzzy wall. And the third was that architecture began with the section that we begin to understand the lines of flows of light and ventilation through a sectional understanding rather than a plan view. Ng Soon's arguments were predominantly based on how do we create identity and how do we create place as architects. He talked about performance, but not very scientifically. It was a kind of an intuitive performance thinking. The one who took performance to a scientific discussion was Ken Yang. He too was uh, of that generation of architects who talked about identity and place and performance. He also brought in uh, the discussion of human comfort. Uh, but Ken Yang uh, presented his work very much as a kind of a scientific treatise on architecture. So many of his ideas of form were based on good passive design, relationship of buildings to climate, sun path, wind, et cetera. Mansam and Richard um, took a lot of these ideas and they built upon them. And one of the key things that they talk about is the place of architecture in the city. So buildings were no longer seen as isolated objects, but they were seen as part of larger urban systems. And here, the creation of uh, microclimates through the, the production of semi-outdoor spaces became very important. This, by the way, uh, is a list of all the ideas captured in their book, uh, Mega Cities, Garden City, uh, in which they talk about different form strategies for uh, building in the tropics, in large cities, high density. Um, I, um, I, I looked at some of these ideas and I've summarized here a taxonomy of semi-outdoor spaces proposed by WOHA from horizontal breezeways, which are these tunnels for the movement of air and light, to atrium breezeways, which are these high-rise um, vertically stacked breeze uh, atrium spaces, double skin systems, um, uh, sky terraces, vertical breezeways, which are these vertical voids, and, and lifting the building off the ground to create a kind of an elevated box. So they, um, I think what's noteworthy about their work is that they were very interested in how form could be adapted to the high rise typology. Uh, and they looked at it in a much greater detail than Ken Yang had done, for example, with his bio, bioclimatic model. I wanna show you <clears throat> some of the uh, research that I've been doing lately on, on these semi-outdoor spaces. And here, is, here are some findings from uh, an empirical study of uh, Woha buildings in Singapore by uh, my PhD student, Juan Gamero. Um, and uh, what Juan did, uh, he visited Singapore for a few months and he measured um, the uh, uh, four uh, uh, buildings by Woha. And he looked at how the semi-outdoor spaces were performing as, a, as, a, as a, a set of environmental variables. And this is what he found. Well, he found that, for example, in these semi-outdoor spaces, air temperature was uh, up to 2.3 degrees cooler than the outside. Air movement was on an average about 0.86 meters higher, even when wind speeds were low, but it could reach as much as 2.26 meters per second. Uh, the likelihood of comfort, where PMV was defined as zero to plus one, was estimated at 98%. And self-reported energy usage uh, in, in one particular building, Skyville at Dawson, when compared to another building next to it, was 17% lower. And he did a calculation to say how much this would mean in terms of energy cost and CO2 emissions for Singapore if every building in Singapore were designed like Skyville at Dawson. The second big idea is form as a social network. And um, <clears throat> in, in high density uh, Asian cities, one of the biggest problem we face is of um, space. How do we create public space? How do we create um, a quality of life when you have so many people living in such close proximity? Skyville at Dawson is a really interesting um, example of how this has been done. Um, Woha, uh, this is a development, a public housing development in Singapore with about um, 1,000 apartments uh, uh, stacked together in 
in um, six um, a tower configuration, connected towers. And at different points in these towers are these sky terraces, which uh, create social space at intervals. So the idea uh, Mansam and Richard often talk about is that uh, you would always be uh, within shouting distance of the next terrace. And you know, uh, uh, a parent could call out their children playing on on an intermediate sky terrace. And and even in a building of this scale, there is this kind of relatability uh, between community space and the apartments. Uh, this is a little uh, diagrammatic explanation of how it works. So you have uh, both horizontal and vertical porosity. The building is lifted off the ground as per the uh, as per the semi outdoor taxonomy that I showed. Um, and the building is basically organized into what what they call village clusters. So the entire population is broken down into smaller villages. Every village is serviced by these uh, sky gardens. So uh, Kwan. Um, did a survey of Skyville at Dawson, and he compared it to a second building situated right next to it, Sky Terrace at Dawson. Now, both buildings are uh, very similar in size, and they were built around the same time with very similar palette of materials. But the big difference um, was the way in which uh, the buildings are organized. Uh, so Skyville, for example, on the left, uh, places a lot of emphasis on social space, whereas Sky Terrace, has these social spaces, but they tend to be external to the building in the form of balconies and rooftop spaces. In Skyville, they are much more uh, internalized uh, semi-outdoor spaces. And so he surveyed people uh, in both buildings and he asked them how many neighbors they knew. And so he found that, um, uh, first of all, the, uh, the social spaces of Skyville on the left were far more utilized than the one by the ones in Sky Terrace. Uh, 250 visitors compared to 60 uh, in the two buildings. Um, but interestingly, what he found is that the Skyville resident says they know an average of 10.2 people, neighbors, compared to 7.5 in Sky Terrace. Now, that's a, that's a, um, it doesn't speak to the quality of that relationship. Uh, maybe they don't like each other, but it is an interesting metric. Um, uh, in, to understand how um, uh, the the organization of space creates opportunities for people to interact, so it it speaks to the the behavioral outcomes and the social outcomes of the organization of uh, uh, public spaces, social spaces. The third um, idea has to do with form as a kind of a um, ecosystem, and and by ecosystem we mean the the network of living and non-living things, the flows of um, uh, water, energy, and uh, the flora and fauna that that, that rely on these. Uh, now, of course, uh, Ken Young uh, was one of the first to talk about the building as a kind of a substrate for ecosystems. Um, he went from discussing the building as uh, patches of greenery to connected greenery in which um, uh, uh, animals and birds could actually move. So it was not just a kind of a, um, a static relationship, but one in which the building becomes part of a larger network. Uh, and here you see both the ideas being expressed at the building scale, the built form, but also at the master plan scale, uh, where the contiguity, the, the, the movement of greenery uh, was becoming important. So the idea was that you create connectivity. Um, his most famous building uh, is in Singapore, Solaris. Um, this is a, a project in which uh, there are many rooftop uh, gardens, of course, but the building is kind of wrapped with this, um, uh, how do you say, like a ribbon of greenery. Uh, and the idea is that uh, the building creates a pathway for the movement of species. There haven't been um, uh, any um, um, audits done on biodiversity, but um, Anecdotal evidence uh, of the building seems to suggest that it does have um, uh, a substantial amount of uh, species uh, living in it. Um, and the, the thing that you see on the right is a list of all the strategies that he has proposed in his recent book, Constructed Ecosystems. In fact, that is a term that he often uses to describe um, how uh, his buildings address the idea of ecosystems. Uh, and many of these strategies are features, but they also form strategies. Uh, the idea, for example, having uh, linear 
uh, linked habitats and not just having them in patches, but actually creating con continuity. Uh, the other thing that's been happening that's very, very interesting, and, and it seems to be shaping the form argument is policy in Singapore. Now, um, in Singapore, we have, uh, uh, we promote skyrise greening, and these are all buildings in Singapore that have uh, pushed the argument for how greenery is brought into buildings and how it is integrated um, both on the ground and vertically. Um, I will just show you a few examples of this, um, the effects of this policy in the works of uh, WOHA. This is um, Park Royal Collection at Pickering. Now, what's interesting about this project um, and um, is the way that it is explained by, uh, by Mansam and Richard. Um, they talk about the relationship of the building to the park in front of it. And they said that the goal was to create on the building the same amount of greenery as was present in the park to match it, so to speak. Now, um, of course, to do that, because the site is much strong, smaller, uh, the amount of greenery has to be vertically distributed. And you can see at the bottom this, this figure, what we call the green plot ratio. It tells us that the, the amount of greenery on the site is twice the size of the site, 2.4 times the size of the site. Um, but what was interesting about this, unlike a lot of the buildings that they had talked about before, where there were green walls or there were green roofs, they were starting to link uh, the building to the urban condition. So there was this very conscious attempt. It was one of the first times that they made this argument that it wasn't enough what a building does within its own site, but it has to have this conversation with the world around it. Um, and, and so the, the numbers game was really about providing um, substance to that conversation. In this project, which came later, uh, the amount of greenery was exponentially higher. In fact, the green plot ratio here is 1,110%. So the amount of greenery in the building is about 100 times the site area. Uh, this is the Oasia Hotel downtown. Uh, and you can see from these diagrams by Woha that they have made a very conscious effort to introduce up to 50 species of plants uh, throughout the building. <clears throat> And they did a bio, uh, biodiversity survey in uh, 2018, and they found that this building was indeed uh, becoming a home to birds and climbing animals, and that the number of species that are found in this one building in downtown Singapore, in a very high density area, in just this one building, was about half the total number of species found in the nearby area. So it was working as something more. It, it had this invisible relationship in terms of the movement of species and the creation of habitats. A building could become a habitat, it could become a stepping stone within a wider network. I wanna show one building that is uh, important uh, in this discussion, which is not by any of the three architects. Uh, this is the Kutik Pot Hospital done by uh, CPG consultants. Uh, this was a very interesting hospital design because it was commissioned with uh, the explicit in, in, uh, intent of being a biophilic building. And so uh, the, the developer, the, uh, the, the CEO of Alexandra Health stipulated that the building had to provide nature as a key resource for healing. Uh, and this was based on scientific evidence of how presence of nature, water and greenery promotes well-being. And so the architecture organizes itself around the central courtyard and opens up to a large um, stormwater pond. This is a view of that courtyard, which uh, we measured, by the way, um, in, in one research project, and we found that it was two to three degrees cooler in this space between these buildings than in the public housing estate around it. Uh, so it was having a tremendous impact in terms of urban heat island effect. But I, you know, I've been to this hospital many times and I joke that, you know, it's the only hospital you go to where your blood pressure goes down when you go in. You know, it's, um, it has this kind of a calming effect on you. Of course, um, all this uh, water and greenery um, has a tremendous impact on biodiversity. And I, I think it's remarkable how many birds and insects and fish can be found on this, uh, on this small piece of land. In fact, the Nature Society of Singapore has done a count 
and they found more than a hundred species of birds and butterflies, no, birds, dragonfly, butterflies, and fishes, more than a hundred of each, uh, in this very small piece of land in north of Singapore in a high density area. <clears throat> what is also interesting is how the form of the building begins to accommodate this kind of community space. So the roof of this building is a farm, which is opened up to the neighborhood and uh, people uh, all would come here to do vegetable farming. So we see here um, in, in the organization of the form of the architecture, uh, three things happening. It's the integration of blue, green, and public space. And these three things come together in unique waves to form uh, what is called a social and ecological construct. So I want to talk a little bit about this idea of social ecological space. This this new kind of space that um, buildings in Singapore and in, in, in parts of Asia are trying to create now, that it is neither one nor the other, but it represents the overlaps between the human made and the natural. Uh, this is Kampong Admiralty by Woha. It's a community building uh, set in a public housing estate in, uh, in North Singapore. And again, if you look at how um, the green and the blue and the public space are organized, you begin to see that um, there is this kind of multifunctionality of systems. Uh, the building starts to integrate uh, these ideas into common spaces, and these are kind of woven into the fabric of the program of the building. Uh, here we see uh, the flow of water, how it moves from uh, the roof terraces, which collect the rainwater, filter it down through cascading plant uh, boxes into rain gardens and then into tanks and biotopes. And then it gets recirculated uh, for non-portable use through the building. So the, the architecture is, um, is mimicking ecosystem services. Uh, it's, it's taking lessons from nature and translating them into uh, systems that replace mechanical and uh, electrical systems uh, of water collection and distribution. Of course, um, uh, this is the, the grand uh, space of this uh, project, which is the roof, uh, which is both a public park, a uh, vegetable garden, and um, a biodiversity habitat. Um, in, uh, in an audit, it was found that the roof of this building has the greatest mix of insects, mammals, amphibians, reptiles, and fishes, the second largest variety of birds in the neighborhood, which is to say that it was more heavily utilized by uh, fauna than any other green patch in that area, in that in that housing estate. Uh, it's also become a social nexus. In the years since it opened, it has hosted over 130 uh, community activities and it has drawn 83,000 visitors from across the city. So I move on to the to the to the next idea of form, the form as connective tissue. Um, all three architects are very interested in how um, the organization of these systems in the buildings creates a relationship between the architecture, the neighborhood, and the city. So the idea of the urban and the architectural begins to dissolve. Heng Sun uh, was perhaps uh, a pioneer in this. Um, he talked about the tropical city in ways that have not been discussed before. Uh, here we see the key tenets of tropical cities. He talks about, first of all, you have to have mixed use. Monofunctionalism is death. Yeah? Low density is death. You need mixed use, high density. You need what he called three-dimensional planning, that you cannot see the master plan as zones in plan form, but you really have to begin to see the way in which different functions are stacked up vertically. You need to create a network of public spaces. You need to create a grid of structure and services that facilitates the growth of the master plan. And the roof has to be, again, like his earlier ideas of the tropical building, had to be this important space for shelter and water. And finally, way ahead of his time, this was in the 1980s, he talked about greenery and biodiversity as being central of the master plan as a kind of a tropical forest, uh, a de facto forest um, in which humans coexist with uh, other forms of life. 
This here you see is the uh, Bugis Kampung Bugis development guideline plan in uh, in the in the mid 80s, way ahead of its time. Never got built, but uh, was profoundly influential. And here we see um, the knock-on effects of these ideas in in the work of Woha more recently. Uh, this was a few years ago in a master plan that they did for Jakarta and Indonesia. Um, this is a city that uh, a master plan that where they they argued that it would be self sufficient in terms of energy, in terms of food, and in terms of water. Um, and how this would be done had a lot to do with a lot of the ideas that King Soon was talking about three dimensional planning. And here you see the ideas of three dimensional planning, how the building becomes stacked as a series of systemic layers where the roof becomes a very important functional space. It becomes both the space for farming and for uh, solar energy production. And then you have the programmatic spaces in the middle. And then the ground becomes this kind of ecological space and, and park-like space. And then underground, you have a lot of the uh, rapid movement service, uh, things like trains and, and major roads and highways. So this idea that the future of the tropical city was one in which we invert the skyline. Um, from one in which you have these varying heights of buildings to one in which you begin to imagine the city like a a, 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 a flat a roof of a, a tropical rainforest canopy. And the buildings vary in height underneath it, but the roof becomes the datum that connects everything together. It, to me, this was a fundamental rethink of the way in which we think about urban morphology. And what's interesting about it is that if you start to look at some of these diagrams at, 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 um, at the buildings, you see Skyville, you know, the program, the, the building I showed you, the public housing uh, project I showed you earlier, you see that the self-sufficient city is really an expansion of an architectural idea. So they were expanding the idea of scale from a single building to a city and, and making cities from agglomerations of these buildings and creating new configurational possibilities. This idea that we can somehow uh, organically transform cities by uh, looking at um, uh, the way individual buildings perform, that individual buildings can, individual developments can provide the connective tissue. This is, this is not new. Yeah? Uh, Hong Kong has been doing it for a long time. In Hong Kong, there is a policy that encourages developers to connect above ground. So if you if you create an overhead um, uh, link to the building next to you and you maintain this public access, you get a little bit of extra built up area. Yeah. And as a result of that, organically over time, the city has transformed because you get this labyrinth of pathways and passages. You can move through the city without ever touching the ground. Singapore is another very interesting example where this idea that the city is a network and this network needs to be protected, you know, and, and parks, it, the, our National Parks Board, which is responsible for, the, for the, the greenery and the parks of the city, have begun to look at ways to repair the network. So they've started to create nature ways, which are roads that act as connections for the movement of biodiversity. They've started to create what they call the PCN, the Park Connector Network, which links different parcels, patches of green with uh, pathways for uh, people and animals to move. So I wanna, I, I wanna share with you how these ideas um, about form at the scale of the building and at the scale of the city can become transformative. And here I, I, I will share the work of my postgraduate program. And I, I know Matthias and Wolfgang have seen this before. Um, but I, I think uh, there's a little bit of development to this, uh, which you haven't seen, and I, I, I will share that. But I, I think it's a very interesting experiment that we have been carrying out uh, with Boha in collaboration with Boha. Uh, Wang Man Sam uh, co-teaches the postgraduate program uh, at NUS, and we have this idea, and we're, we're obsessed with it, that we can create the self-sufficient city one building at a time. And so every year, every semester, we get a bunch of very smart uh, students coming to us from across the Asia, and we give them this assignment. We say, what if every if a building in Singapore were to engage the wider system of systems? So how would you redesign this building 
to have this conversation with the city. And so here is an example of something that was done by one of the students. This is the um, Singapore Parliament building, which she picked to redesign. Um, and so the idea is that you pick a building in Singapore that exists and you redesign it according to five systems, energy, water, food, public space, and greenery. And you redesign it to maximize the interaction of that building to the to the systems around it. So she took the existing uh, form of the parliament building, which looks like that, which is next to a river in a very important uh, downtown area, and she transformed it into this, uh, which was a large uh, public space with a solar canopy, lots of greenery and water that connects the building to the river. So this was the, the form idea, very powerful form idea, very different from what was proposed before. And here is how she then goes on to explain this. And these are just images of how this building would look um, as, a, as, an, as an architectural idea. She, the, every student is required then to explain each building that they've redesigned according to the five systems. And so here is how this building works in terms of the water systems, how it um, collects rainwater, how, how self-sufficient is it in terms of its own water demand and how the water uh, in the project communicates or has an exchange with a hydrological system around it. In this case, the Singapore River. This shows you the green, the public space, how the building expands the public space of the city by drawing people in and creating community space and, and opportunities for interaction. And this shows you how it expands room for biodiversity by creating green patches that can become habitats that link this development with green patches in the downtown area. This shows you the energy logic, um, how the roof is a large energy producing um, uh, surface. And so then we said, okay, well, what if all buildings in Singapore were to do this? What if all buildings in Singapore were to generate energy? And over successive years, we have built up a database of buildings redesigned by our students. And so this is just a sampling of of all these buildings um, in terms of what they do for energy. And so the idea is to maximize energy production and create as much self-sufficiency of energy demand as possible. Of course, some buildings it's possible, the low rise, low energy demand buildings, it's very easy to get to zero energy or maybe even be net positive. And in some buildings, it's not so easy, but they have to push the argument. They have to push as far as they can. And so then we said, well, Okay, so we have a sample of maybe 50, 60 buildings. What if every building in Singapore were doing this? And so we, we took a database of the building stock in Singapore and we started to look at how different building typologies or different uh, building programs, how much energy could they produce based on our data set of about 50 buildings? Yeah. If we took the 50 buildings to be representative of all buildings, how would that extrapolate? And so this, this map just shows you how that, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a thought experiment, yeah. Um, I don't think anybody is gonna build it tomorrow, but just what that would look like, you know, an entire landscape of solar roofs. And then we did the calculations and we said that the current energy gap uh, is about 73.7 .7 terawatt hours. If all buildings in Singapore were to A, reduce their energy demand by about 50%, which is not unthinkable, yeah. Um, you know, Green Mark, which is our green rating system, already says that you have to go to 30%. If you push the argument a little further, and if you redesign buildings so that they're 50% better than what's out there, it's doable, yeah? So this was a target that we thought was possible. And then they maximize the solar PV on roof. How much uh, would that satisfy the energy, uh, meet the uh, self-sufficiency gap? And it would drop to 25.9. Then we said, well, what if we took all the infrastructure in the city we took our roads, we took our MRT stations, um, we took our train tracks, and we covered them all with solar PV. I mean, it was, a, it was a purely quantitative argument, which is just to say, how far can we stretch this? Yeah. And we found that if we do that, the, um, the, uh, the energy gap drops to 17.6. Then we said, what if we take all the big infrastructure, and this is our, um, on the left, you see the, uh, the future, uh, container terminal, the, the shipping uh, container terminal. On the right, you see Changi Airport, including the new terminal that's being built. 
Below you see the MRT train depots, uh, which are all over the island, which occupy large footprints of land. And we said, well, let's say we cover everything with solar PV uh, and we push the limits of production. That would bring us down to 12.2. And then we said, of course, we have to have floating solar farms. There is so much um, territorial water in Singapore. Our lakes and our water bodies could support a uh, huge infrastructure for energy production. And with that, we were actually net positive. I mean, I, uh, this is an oversimplification. Keep in mind that uh, everybody working on this, most of them were architects. <laughs> so they're, um, they are technologically challenged uh, a little bit, you know, um, but they, they, uh, you know, and, and they recognize that, you know, there are, there are questions of energy storage and there are questions of um, variants of production and so on, and that it cannot be so simplistically done today, but the numbers are startling. Yeah. The numbers are shocking. And even if you could do half of this, that would be something that would be amazing. And this is what the map of Singapore would look like if we went the whole way. Yeah. So then we said, well, okay, what do we do about water? And we repeated uh, these ideas. Every building already was addressing all five systems. So we looked at how much water each building was producing, what level of self-sufficiency was available. We looked at how much greenery the buildings were producing or uh, were creating on their surface. We looked at how much public space was being created uh, and added to the public space of the city and how much food in, uh, was being produced by these buildings. So many of these buildings had high uh, high tech farms built into them. Some of them had community gardens, et cetera. And we found that yes, it was possible to be energy self-sufficient. With all the other systems, yes, you could be water self-sufficient quite easily, yeah. If we were to trap uh, a lot of the rainwater at the at the point of building, at the point of consumption, because right now we have a lot of water in the city, it goes into a centralized uh, catchment, it then gets cleaned and it goes pumps back. But what if what if the building had the capacity to utilize the water at source? So you don't get all this evaporative loss, you don't waste all this energy pumping it, it could be very easily self-sufficient. In fact, we could probably sell water. The, the shocker was food. We found that if we changed our diet a little bit, get rid of the meat, we could potentially be 100% self-sufficient. The public space in Singapore would double. The greenery in Singapore would double. This was, this was amazing. Uh, uh, and like I said, the, the point of it was not just to, to argue that uh, you have to go all the way, but it was really looking at how far the form thinking at the building scale should be held accountable, right? Um, uh, we let our buildings get away with too much. Our buildings are doing too little, yeah? We just assume that they are there to take, 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 and. And okay, we argue that you have to take less, but actually every building, if it was designed in a different way to engage the, uh, the larger systems could become part of a urban infrastructure. So the criticism that we had at one point uh, was that, well, you know, this is great. It's a, it's, a, it's a numbers game, it's a quantitative game, how does it change the quality of the urban spaces? How does it change the, the experience of the city? So the last semester, um, we've been looking at what if you apply this idea, not just to the scale of the building, but to the scale of the neighborhood. And so we started to look at this idea of uh, urban resilience and we gave students different parcels of land. I'm just gonna show you one. This is a, um, an industrial area uh, in the Southwest of Singapore. Um, it's got a mix of um, housing and industry and the purple things that you see there in the land use map, that's where a lot of the industry is located. And so we said, what if you target uh, big parcels of, of, of this land and transform it into something that begins to bring all these systems together in a new way? What would that mean? Uh, not just to the numbers, we know what the numbers will look like, but what will that mean to the quality of life? And so these are some of the maps that were done uh, by the students. And it just shows you, for example, that that patch that you're looking at on the left, the, the highlighted patch has very little greenery, has very little public space. 
um, has very little water. Yeah. Uh, and so um, it was the kind of landscape that really could be transformed by this idea. And so this is what the students came up with. I just show you very quickly what the master plan looks like. And this is um, um, a, a, a industrial estate, a modern industrial estate with um, with higher density. So it's not just building at the same um, density as the previous one, but it doubles the amount of building stock there is. But but the key to this was the connectivities that they created. Uh, here we see how, for example, the estate um, expands and connects the green networks in 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 the neighborhood. So the park that is existing to the south uh, has been drawn into the estate and connected through along the waterfront to uh, other green patches in the north. This shows you the water systems, how canals that are coming through the site, which are basically concretized hard canals, become these wonderful um, ecosystems. Uh, these um, these these new kinds of um, water features that um, are part of the public experience. This shows you how public space uh, is expanded and connected. You know, our industrial estates today are um, largely very unpleasant spaces, but here is an idea of how that space, even though it has a function that is normally considered sterile and not attractive, can begin to expand the experience of public space in Singapore. And the, the two other systems, which are less spatial, um, are also very present in the way the, uh, the, the master plan is conceived. On the left, you see um, uh, buildings and areas where food would be produced. And on the right, you see um, the spaces where energy would be produced. So I, I, I wanna end off by um, uh, just introducing my book, uh, which was mentioned at the beginning, Ecopuncture. Um, there's a lot of uh, free material uh, connected to the book. If you go on the website, Ecopuncture Asia, you can see uh, projects and information about the book. But the thing that I really wanna encourage you to do is to go on YouTube and you search for Ecopuncture Asia. Um, I've made these uh, free to air documentaries, um, which are uploaded on YouTube and you can watch them uh, obviously without cost. Um, and I call them the Ecopuncture interviews because what I did, since I was interviewing all these people and I was, and I was um, trying to understand their, their approach, I, I filmed it um, and we came back afterwards and we made it into this documentary. Um, so you can, you can hear Ken Yang and uh, Yu Kong Juan and uh, Man Sam and Richard uh, and, and various other people who are doing very interesting projects in Asia on, on their approach to form thinking, to how nature is central to the way we visualize form. Yeah. Um, there is a 40 minute documentary, uh, the full length one, if you don't have the appetite for that, you can watch the seven minute edition. And then if you, if, if that's too long, there are three two minute clips, uh, which you can watch uh, and, and, and get a glimpse of where this is going. Right. Okay, um, that's it uh, for my lecture. I'm going to stop sharing and see if everyone's still there. <laughs> I haven't put anyone to sleep because you know when you're doing this, you, you can only see yourself, and I, I have no idea. Um, so anyway, um, uh, a lot of what I'm presenting today is is um, is in my book. Um, I um, I um, I became very interested in the idea of um, form as an instrument of change. So I think, and I. I, I I want to be candid and say I, I think architects um, tend to leave the discussion of sustainability to the other professions. Um, but actually, we control something very important. We control the way the building is organized. And you know, a building's mechanical systems can be replaced in 10, 20 years, but the form of the building very often stays for the life of the building. And so if you make fundamental decisions about that form, and if you get that right, um, then it really um, uh, transforms the potential of that building in a way that other other professionals and other systems can add on. To. Okay, I stop talking now. Great, thank you so much, Nimal. I think it was really fascinating uh, talk, and the project you showed uh, was so inspiring.
the uh, the attempt to combine basically the perspective you represented with the architectural design. And now I'd like to uh, pass the, the 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 word and and, and ask Matthias to uh, moderate the uh, the last part. We have for today a discussion. I think we have some questions already in the chat. But yeah, now Matthias, the floor the floor is yours. Yeah, also from my side, no, man, this was really inspiring. I, like I was really having a hard time to watching a lecture while taking notes. Uh, so no, this was super nice. Um, I see that uh, there's on the online there there's one question, but I would also motivate the the audience uh, to ask questions to take the opportunity. And don't be shy. There are no stupid questions. There might be only stupid answers. And if you ask a question, please, I, I would uh, recommend to just turn your camera on when it's more a personal question. So I open up the floor, maybe uh, to, to get the question session uh, going, there's, I will uh, hand the question over to Stephen Poon. Um, and I don't uh, read your question, Stephen, if uh, I would invite you to frame your question personally. If you have a, a camera and a mic, it would be great if you could uh, place your question. Mm. Hello. Hi. Uh, hello. Hi, I'm Girisha from IUSD. Uh, hello, Nirmal sir. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I really liked how you uh, spoke about form as imperative through different systemic approach and also eventually integrating that systemic approach, bringing together the ecological and social and technical aspects of architecture together. Uh, in our current uh, module, we're also working on designing for, like, especially my group's working on designing for a tropical climate. So it was extremely useful that way because I could relate with my work in progress. A question I had in mind also to be uh, a little selfish with respect to my own project here. Uh, the uh, aspect I'm also struggling with right now is about dealing with um, integrating greenery in an extremely humid tropical location. And I'm not sure about the takeaways, uh, the trade-offs with respect to integrating uh, greenery and the humidity it may add to the microclimate because uh, the location I'm designing for in Costa Rica is extremely humid, I mean, to the point of creating mold in buildings. And we're working with wind on dealing with humidity. But my question to you was, with respect to designing for tropical climate, what role does greenery play in with regards to humidity at the site level and how as designers we can work around it to integrate the benefits of the local biodiversity and food infrastructure and green infrastructure while also responding well to comfort with respect to humidity. Well, thank you, Grisha. That's, you. A, that's a really good question. And I, I, I feel like uh, there's an there's a expert in the in the room that is far greater knowledge about thermal comfort than I do. <laughs> Wolfgang, you know I'm I'm going to uh, pick on you because uh, uh, Wolfgang has uh, worked on many tropical buildings and uh, and um, he he literally um, created a, a thermal com a, a cooling system for my my university school building in which uh, uh, these variables of of temperature and humidity had to be calibrated. So I don't know, Wolfgang. I, I I don't want to pass the buck to you, but if 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 you could um, say something, and then I'll add a little bit to that, please. Um, that's a big ball. What you play to me? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it's always for me the question where you come from. So you mentioned mold, Girisha. Mold is something which is actually existing in buildings which are not well ventilated and most likely air conditioned. So that's a typical problem we, we know from the air conditioned world, whereas in a world where you rethink how to connect between indoor and outdoor, how to connect what the built environment and the green is, 
where actually mold becomes less and less a problem the more you, you you're getting connected and the more you understand that between outdoors and indoors there's a kind of mid door and the, the more this this transparency and this porosity is part of the design process the lesser uh, actually mold but also humidity becomes a problem because humidity yes when it gets very out of bounds it, it it's getting challenging but then it's always the question what i'm going to do in this place and how can i address things i would be less afraid of of, of humidity in general too but let me leave this for a moment because i need to play the ball back to, to Myanmar. and i have a question but please add something to what i said and then i have a question for you yeah, no, I, uh, I I totally agree, uh, and you know we 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 really investigated um, in in the zero energy building at my school this this question of uh, adaptive thermal comfort, uh, but, but you know, um, uh, and there's a lot of information on that already. But I, but I, I I want to say that um, you know with in the context of the project that I showed, which is Kutek Quad Hospital, um, uh, it was created with the idea that if you have a lot of greenery and if you have a lot of water, it's going to bring the temperature down. But of course, you're right. You know, as a result of that, um, the configuration of the building also limits air movement, you know, and and, and that courtyard that you see is a little sunken, you know, it's it's a little depressed. So even, even more so, you don't get this kind of easy movement across ventilation. Uh, and of course, if you have trees um, and water that creates a higher level of humidity, but I, I can tell you from 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 experience that um, the perception of two degrees cooler is far more impactful than ten percent more humid. You know, and I I, I believe and I, I I believe that the human body uh, is far more sensitive to shifts in temperature than it is to equivalent shifts in humidity. That when we walk into a cooler space, uh, even if it's slightly more humid, um, it actually feels better. Um, and I know from, from our zero energy building, for example, at um, the School of Design and Environment, the interior is uh, more humid than you would normally have in an air conditioned space. So it's not as dry, let's put it that way. Yeah. But the combination of temperature and air movement makes you feel perfectly comfortable. Yeah. So I, I think that the human body is really um, a, a calibration of these different things. You, you sense all these things differently uh, or in in, in, at the same time. You, you perceive them together. You don't see them as individual. But I also know that uh, we tend to be much more sensitive to changes in temperature. So if I had a choice, I would prioritize the cooling, um, even if it costs me something in terms of humidity. Because if you go and look at the psychrometric chart, you'll see that that shift in temperature is far more valuable than the increase in humidity. Um, because, and, and there is another psychological benefit to this, um, which cannot be underestimated, which is that when you are in a space with a lot of greenery and water, you feel psychologically cooler. I mean, there is a thermal effect, there's a radiant effect of the plants and there is a temperature, but you also feel better. And I, I, I think that that is very powerful um, uh, from, an, from a qualitative point of view. I, I Just one, one uh, comment to this, and then I have my question, Yamal, if, if you don't mind. I think putting, putting people first is the key to resolve these questions, to exactly tap into the knowledge what you just shared, that two degrees perception of coolness is way more important than an increase in humidity by 10%. That is something which we have overlooked in informing our design decisions, overlooked in, 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 in driving design and being less afraid of humidity. I think that's, that's a super important thing. It starts with the people, it starts with the perception. But if you, if you share your presentation and you talk about these things coming together, greenery, the water, the blue, the green, the energy, public spaces, food, it looks all very easy. It looks very logical. And the question immediately, which I have in mind is, why isn't that so easy in my personal life? Why isn't this so easy in my daily work in projects? And why is not everybody doing that? 
Um, is that are you asking me? Why yes, is everyone sure. just doing that? <laughs> um, you got a big ball bag. Yeah, I, uh, I, I. You know, that's a that's a really good that's a really good point, and I I do think that um, there is tremendous inertia, you know, in the way that we think. Um, uh, there is a great deal of resistance to change and to new ideas and. I mean, I, I give you the example of Kutik Pot Hospital. Now, here is a fantastic project. It has won so many awards, including the uh, Stephen Kellett uh, Biophilic Building, uh, the most biophilic building in the world. It won that award. Yeah. Why, why isn't every hospital designed that way? And I, I cannot answer that. Um, Quite frankly, it makes no sense to me. I think if you look at the success of Kutikpat Hospital, if you look at how much it cost to put all that greenery and water in place, if you look at how much it cost to maintain these things, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's five thousand dollars, six thousand dollars a month in landscaping costs. I mean, for that, for that amazing experience. So the economics of this. The, the 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 there is no developmental logic. Um, I think it's only the way we, the mindsets that we have, um, and I I I I feel that sometimes when I take people to Kutikpat Hospital, just to give you an example, the first thing they will say is, "Why does this look like a resort?" And and, and my reaction is. Why shouldn't a hospital look like a resort? Why should a hospital look like a hospital? Why can't it be therapeutic the way a resort or a spa is? You know, so it's these mindsets, you know, or, oh, my God, this is so wasteful. How much money are they spending on this? You know, uh, there are these mindsets about how much this costs um, and how much how much problem there is to maintain this. Um, so I. I I don't know the exact answer to this, and I have a feeling a lot of it is ignorance um, and, and a kind of an institutional resistance to change. Um, uh, it's the same reason why uh, we're having so much trouble getting everyone to agree on the Paris Climate Agreement. You know, it's just stupidity. And that's not a very uh, scientific answer, Ulkan, but... <laughs> But I think you know what I'm talking about when you deal with clients. It's uh, it's it's a whole other way of thinking that you have to battle. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also like it's it's always with the transformation of the built environment that clients want to have buildings which are proven and they're built like many times before. So there's a certain inertia also coming along with innovative building approaches. Which takes some time, I guess. I, I think also we don't make enough of an economic argument. Like, for example, again, you know, going back to Kutikpat Hospital, and I've said this to them a hundred times. I said, you know, why haven't you done a study on patient recovery? You know, you started by saying that this would be a healing environment. Okay. So what is the impact? Let's see the numbers. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to discharge patients um, faster or do they recover faster because, you know, um, of this, all the things that you've done, because if you can demonstrate, and and there have been studies that have shown this in the past, that you know when people are recovering in this kind of environment, they the hospitalization is shorter. You know, uh, if you can show one day reduction in hospitalization, oh my God, think of the economic cost of this. You know, or or the symbolic value of this. You know. Um, so sometimes we don't um, we don't follow through, and I I, I hope that they will uh, do a study on this um, uh, to, to demonstrate what the, um, from a from a developer's point of view what the benefits are because a lot of it is still very intuitive, right? You go in and you go, oh, it's really nice, but uh, what are the numbers to back it up? We need we need more of that. Absolutely. And I think like having like the key performance matrix of a hospital is indeed 
how long do the people need to recover? And I, I'm, I totally, I'm totally with you. Like that, also like architects as the main elements of creating these new solutions, they have to be also creative in finding uh, like uh, understanding the concerns of the stakeholders, which are typically economic concerns to come up with these new KPIs and say like, this is the reason why we build hospitals. It's about recovery. And if you can support us by design form, like when we monitor it and show proof. Yeah. No, I, um, you know, in the book, uh, Ecopuncture, I have all these case studies of projects that do these amazing things. And um, one of the questions I had uh, at the, at the start of the book was, okay, it's very nice what they do, but why do they do it? Um, what do they gain out of it? And it's very interesting. Um, um, even uh, there is this whole idea of capitals that wealth is measured in many ways. There is financial capital, but there's also social capital and human capital and natural capital. So we see wealth, uh, we, we can discuss wealth in many ways, yeah? The assumption in the building industry is that we're only interested in financial capital and we're only interested in payback. What I found with the majority of my projects is that while financial capital was important, it was not the determinant. It was not what was driving the project. Very often it was natural and human capital. Yeah. But it wasn't an act of charity either. The developer was not simply giving money away. They were investing it because the human and social capital usually comes back as financial capital over time. So if you look at um, this project in Sri Lanka, it's a resort, um, you know, uh, it was a brownfield um, a, a contaminated site. The developer buy this, buys this land for cheap because nobody wants it, right? And then he takes all the money that he saves on the land and he hires an ecologist to transform it. So it becomes this amazing ecological space with uh, endangered species and wildlife. I visited it, you know, there were crocodiles, you know, uh, in, in the resort. And, um, and it's this amazing space. And now it's the most, this is like uh, 15 years later, it's the most successful luxury eco resort in the world. So I think that the conversation, um, it doesn't work for everyone, but I, I do feel that we need to change the conversation and begin to talk about different kinds of capitals and discuss the exchange rate between capitals. It's like foreign exchange, you know, um, you buy something in euros and you convert it to Singapore dollars. Maybe you make natural capital now, but tomorrow you get a return on your investment. The, the key to this is your time horizon. If you see things only as buy, sell tomorrow, then there is, no, there is no hope. If you begin to see over a longer time horizon, 10, 20, 30 years, then these investments in creating capital become profitable over time. And that's a conversation that I, I try to influence with the book Ecopuncture to show that these conversations require a change in the time frame that we discuss the project. We can't discuss the project as I build, I sell, and I make a profit and walk away. That is not going to be meaningful. Are there like um, from the audience, I open up the floor again for questions. Maybe from Stephen Poon. He also had the question, how can designer overcome perception that sustainability is a trade-off? I think that is uh, also strongly linked to the things that we discussed at the moment. Like, uh, it's not uh, like, how can it be not a trade-off? How can a sustainability uh, can be understood a wider theme of sustainability as an add-on which creates added value? Not add-on, but like which creates added value instead of hindering. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure um, what is the, um, the, the thinking behind the question about uh, it being a trade-off. Uh, is that implied that it's a cost trade-off or you have to compromise, you have to give up something to be sustainable? What, I, I don't know what that trade-off idea means. Stephen Poon, you have to help us on your question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, um, I, yesterday when I was uh, talking to my uh, Vietnamese um, 
audience, we, we had this workshop and I, I was trying to explain to them that, um, in, and I, I use uh, uh, SDE4 as an example, you know, uh, work down. I, I, I usually show the project and I say, okay, so we wanted a zero energy building. And we realized very early on that to get to this thing that we wanted, we would have to live with certain trade-offs. Yeah, we would have to learn to manage our expectations. We would have to learn to manage our behavior and we would have to manage the way we see things, you know? Um, so for example, we have this, you know, uh, $2 million roof with solar PV to, to get us the zero energy target. Um, where does that come from? Because, you know, university was not going to give us more money. It was, it had to come from the project budget. So we said, okay, we're a school of design. You know, we don't need to have expensive tiles or ceilings and let's go for a finishless bu building. You know, we had a very good architect. Um, and he, um, he was able to design the building in a very, you know, um, raw aesthetic with uh, concrete floors and without any plaster. It was actually, it looks really nice in an in in industrial way. Um, and we saved a lot of money um, from, from uh, the budget in, in terms of uh, spending money on this. And then the other thing that we did, and this is uh, thanks to Wolfgang, you know, Wolfgang said to us at the beginning, he said, you want to be zero energy? Okay, this is your energy budget. This is how big your roof is, and this is how much energy you can have. The question is, what do you want to do with it? So we said, okay, well, we can give up this and we can moderate that. We can buy more efficient computers or equipment, blah, blah, blah. Still not enough. <laughs> I remember that very difficult moment where he came back and he said, we're still not zero. And so we said, okay, at six o'clock every day, we switch off the air conditioning. Now this is this is unheard of in Singapore, um, you know, because we are we are the air conditioned nation for, for good reason. Um, and so our dean at the time said, "Okay, we want this. We really want to be zero energy, and we're going to switch off the cooling system at six o'clock. You can have the fans. You open the windows. It's perfectly okay." It was a psychological adjustment. It's not that they're less comfortable. <laughs> It's just that they had to overcome this idea that this was inferior in some way. So um, I, I don't know if that answers his question about trade-offs, but I, I think what it is, it's not that you're giving up something, but you're adjusting the framework of thinking that maybe my expectations or my life or what I want is not necessary. Maybe there is another way to do this, you know? Maybe I don't need to have expensive marble tiles. You know? I think I see a couple of answers. Hi, Deepshi. By the Hi. way, Deepshi is uh, the uh, graduate of my program. She was in the first or the second cohort of the program. So she's a pioneer graduate from my <laughs> master's program. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, it's always great to hear to you, and for the first time, it was on the time zone that matches me. <laughs> it's 3, 4 a.m., so I'm at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology uh, here, and Wolfgang, you may not remember, but eight years ago, you had taught me as well. <laughs> A reunion. <laughs> Is it? Um, so, yeah, I think what I have is more like is is a comment per se is that in this idea of increasing the greenery the public space and so on do you think that we are aiding to this carbon spike that happens in the next 10 20 years from now you know that for example uh, uh, in all the projects that you showed these are all very systems integrated thinking but the moment you start to do this in isolation on buildings, and I don't want to name, but for example, Bosco Verticale or Thousand Trees and so on, you put in so much more concrete, so you add in much more embodied energy into your projects with not knowing that it is actually for performance or just for increasing the greenery. So where can we start to have this conversation of systems thinking more 
understandable in the design industry. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And I, um, um, by the way, I'm not a big fan of, um, of, of, of the, um, the, the vegetative buildings. Yeah. Me neither. I, um, yeah, yeah. But I, you know, this I, becomes a trend. Every time we introduce something like this in the name of yeah. sustainability, certain things, things start to become a trend. Yeah. I, 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 again, you know, I, I go back to some of the projects that I showed. Um, and I, I feel that we have to be much more strategic about the way we think about these things. Um, mm -hmm. If we begin to think about everything, everything that we create as having a single function, um, then we start to add a lot of things because we have new functions, you know. So we need to create balconies with uh, big, deep balconies for trees, or we have to create, you know, uh, new structures or heavy roofs. Um, I think that if you look at um, the philosophy of, of Woha, um, they really argue for a three-dimensional, multi multifunctional way of thinking. So every piece of land uh, does many things at the same time. It creates a park on the ground. It creates a program and amenity uh, in the mid-levels. It creates um, subterranean spaces for some of the services. And it turns the roof into productive spaces, you know, whether it's for farming or for solar energy. Um, I, one of the things that we did with the studio exercise is that we began to look at how much more building we need if we do all these things. So the question that you're asking is an interesting one. And um, once and I, one year, we, we, we grabbed a bunch of students and we said, okay, now here are 60 buildings. Compare these 60 buildings with the original building and tell us how much more building there is, how much more yeah. Yeah. Uh, built up area there is. Mm -hmm. And what they found um, was that the, surprisingly, it wasn't that much bigger. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't double the size, for example, because you have all these things. The average increase in built up area before and after was between 10 to 20%, mm -hmm. you know. And but for that 10 to 20 percent of increased built up area, you had zero energy, zero water, uh, carbon sequestration through through uh, greenery, biodiversity, public space and so on. Now, I, I can't do the carbon calculations and tell you whether the two things trade off, mm -hmm. but I do think that the, the the smarter thing to do is to not see these things as add-ons, but to see them as deeply integrated. And if you synergize things like um, like um, 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 that that uh, project could take part, you know, well, you had the roof anyway, you know, yes. why not turn it into a farm? Mm -hmm. Well, you have the roof anyway, why not turn it into a productive space for energy? You know, with a little bit more, you can do a lot more. Yeah. So. I, I don't argue for, um, you know, the kind of decorative greening that you see in, in these projects where you just ply on trees because it looks organic, you know. I think it's much more important to look at how you calibrate different systems and how you use a single thing many times over. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the most valuable thing that we have, and I know you don't feel this in Switzerland, but we do in Singapore. The most valuable thing that we have is land. Yes. If you can take a piece of land and use it many, many, many times over through strategic 3D planning, then you have really, really stretched the value of that resource. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that that's, that's the way to think about it. I, I, I can't answer your question completely because I know you're, you're talking about carbon and that's a complicated um, uh, piece of mathematics. But we did look at how much more, and I, I was frankly surprised. I thought it would be a lot more. Ten to twenty percent doesn't sound like a massive increase in building size. That's to do also all because these Singapore things. is high density, you know. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and and we are we are out of necessity forced to stretch this idea, you know, and um, and to push um, the logic to its limit.
Thank you. Adding one comment to this, mm -hmm. Nemal, and uh, if she, I think when we need more floor, more ground on this planet to grow trees and greenery, which then is used by shifting it into a building as decoration, then there's something broken here. And I think if if the nature and if the if the greenery and if it's vertical or not growing by itself and adding to fit photosynthesis without absorbing another piece of of a land somewhere else to be pre-grown, mm -hmm. that would be the question I would have. Yeah, is it is it this kind or is it that kind of greenery? Is it decorative? And and actually, I absorb resources from somewhere else. Or is mm -hmm. it something by itself, which works by itself? That probably changes the way of greenery. So I would not intend to have tropical plants in a place which doesn't allow tropical plants. Uh, but I think that's a kind of question. What do I give back with my design intent, with what I what I built, or do I absorb? And then it's a similar nonsense to absorbing fossil fuels or um, whatever kind of materials. Yes, yes. For example, we were doing this study here that said if we start to build now with wood which is now becoming the trend and we say that now onwards we built everything in wood only 70 percent of forest would be gone if we start to use wood to build the buildings uh, so that's another thing to look at that these things suddenly that you know perhaps building in wood is becoming more and more uh, common and claimed to be sustainable is not as such this sustainable. Really, it is the growth in the forest. Wood takes about 60, 70 years to grow back in the forest. So the cycle is not rejuvenated as such. Um, so then, the, so I think this question is more about this idea of sustainability from the systems thinking. I, and I think you answered it really well, Dr. Nemo, that it hasn't has to be thought alone. It has to be thought in an integrated manner. And one thing has to do more than the other. I agree. Right. And I, I um, personally, I, I'm more excited um, by um, demonstrations of urban farming than I am with decorative greening. Yes. Um, I think the um, the problem of um, uh, urban expansion, both physically but also in terms of resource demand, uh, is having a devastating impact on uh, rainforests. Uh, you know, uh, China, uh, Vietnam and and uh, China, uh, Indonesia have lost, um, I think, a third of their rainforests, uh, the forests, in in a very short period of time. And I think a lot of this has to do with demand for food. Um, mm -hmm. And if we could somehow bring a more productive approach to greenery, you know, and I, I, I like um, the idea of rooftops being turned into farming spaces. Um, but for that, you have to rethink the form of the building. You have to rethink the form of the city. You know, when you have many, many tall buildings with small roof areas, it, it's just not economically logical. But when you have this kind of, you know, flattened landscape of connected roofs, then suddenly the roof becomes um, a resource. It becomes land, you know, and mm -hmm. you can you can produce a lot of food very inexpensively with very high yield um, with technologies today. Um, so I I'm personally more excited by that. I I think um, for me that 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 represents a position on nature yes. that yes. is far more meaningful than to have a roof with you know, lots of greenery. Um, I think mm -hmm. to intensify uh, urban farming production is is um, is perhaps the thing that, at least in Asia, um, I think we have to look at very very seriously. Are there more questions from the audience? Wolfgang, you want to say something? I have a question. Natalia. Sorry, I, I don't have a working camera here in my computer, but um, I really wanted to ask something. Which time zone are you? 
I am in Bogota. It's almost 7 a.m. <laughs> Excellent. Welcome. Uh, thank you. So um, I'm Girish's classmate, and we're actually working together on this Costa Rica project based project. And I wanted to ask something. Um, we were wondering about uh, the dichotomy we found, which is how to deal with the fact of perhaps using sun to decrease the humidity sensation on one hand and shading spaces in, uh, in order to cool them as they are both tropical spaces, tropical challenges. Um, do, do you think is one more important than the other or how could we create balance between these two aspects? Um, sorry, I, you said that, uh, that there's a tension between using sun to reduce humidity versus uh -huh. um, and also shading, shade, shading as a, to create a tool cooling, to create a comfort in the spaces. Um, I have to confess, and Wolfgang, maybe you can help me out here, but I've never, <laughs> I've. Uh, I've I've never heard the argument that we have to use the sun to reduce the humidity. Um, at least not in the tropics. Um, I, I know the humidity gets lower when it gets uh, yeah, but, sunnier. But, let's turn it. Uh, let's turn it around. I think we had that kind of this discussion last week. Also, it is about what is driving the perception, and okay. I think um, this is interesting um, to to be studied with. Um, let me say models of human perception of comfort. What, would humidity be perceived different in the sun or in the shade? And I think the, the, this question needs to be expanded to the understanding of what is driving my perception. And probably if I'm really in the sun in a tropical place, I don't care so much anymore for the humidity. That doesn't mean that the humidity is good or bad. It's just that I am in the wrong let me say, exposure to, to something which is really dominating my comfort, which is sun. So I wouldn't say this can balance out that. I would say in certain conditions, and in particular in outdoor conditions, people would react to the most, most dominating factor, which is definitely in a warm environment if I'm standing in the sun. Definitely in a cold environment, if I have the choice, I would go into the sun. And um, humidity plays... That's what I know, a, a smaller role in this. And I think um, is it, if this is the studio, um, Matthias, what you run, then I think it is worth what I suggested last week to look into the tools which are online available to learn, uh, to learn about that. Um, what is dominating under which condition, what is perceived as comfort? I think that, that is the... That is the door I would walk through to find answers here. Um, and I would not be afraid of humidity. <laughs> Does it uh, answer your question, Natalia? Mm -hmm. I think that's quite good. Uh, yeah, because we were, um, we were actually saying that uh, humidity is not like an extreme uh, Humidity in San Jose, which is the capital of Costa Rica, is not as extreme as in maybe in other places. So uh, we are actually working with uh, Anna, uh, who comes from there, and she says that um, sun has this impact, which is kind of uh, decreases the perception of humidity. So it's definitely a matter of perception, as you say. Um, but but yeah, maybe we are really afraid of humidity because this is like creating a lot of problems in buildings and maybe maybe we have to like search questions and answers in that matter. I wonder if there's an uh, element of um, uh, cultural adaptation as well. You know, Wolfgang, I, um, I had a student who was from Russia um, a couple of semesters ago and we visited SDE4, the, the zero energy building. And the first thing he said when he walked in um, was, why is the interior so humid? And and I said, I don't feel it. And he said, no, I can feel it. The air is very heavy. Um, mm -hmm. And I was thinking to myself, oh, um, <laughs> I, I, I am so used to humidity in the tropics that when I walk into a building, which is, you know, slightly less dry than a, I, I don't I don't feel it. It's not a big thing for me. Uh, but for somebody coming from Moscow, 
you know, the air was heavy, you know. Um, and I, I suspect if he lives in Singapore long enough, he will stop talking like that. Um, and I, I, but, uh, I think that just tells us a story about how we are, how we are, we are conditioned by something where we come from or by something we think we should pay attention to. These are two things, mm -hmm. what I feel and what I think I should solve. But this is, I think, an excellent moment to understand how these questions then form, where do we put energy into our design, where we spend and try to find solutions, um, rather than rethinking, do I ask the right question? Mm -hmm. I think it, it, it is, it is um, a big lesson learned that uh, what you said, the perception of comfort is culturally learned. It comes from the background. It comes from where I spent the last months yeah, and where, I, where I'm used to. And I think if I understand that, then I can leave a little bit behind to be afraid of humidity. In particular, if I design in places which are used to have to, to have a more humid climate. Yeah. Mm. That doesn't mean that all humidity is acceptable. There's, there, we at Transala, we have projects in Kuwait, in Doha, in Abu Dhabi. There are moments where I say that's unbearable. Yeah. That's just unbearable. But this is way beyond what we discussed, what you have in, in, in Costa Rica or what you have in, in Singapore. Yeah. Mm. These are these coastal, coastal desert climates, which are out of the discussion what we have here. Yeah, yeah, I think you definitely got a point in there. Thank you very much. I have a, I have a question, Nima. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a wonderful topic um, to talk about form and architecture, because if you look back at least, like what, in terms of the green architecture, sustainability, we have like in the 80s, we have the solar, like the solar innovation and let's say the solar, at least in the middle or European cities, like how can we use passive solar to lower the energy demand? And this had, this had an, a big impact on form of architecture because we are like this greenhouse attached to residential buildings with like optimized into solar exposure. And then uh, after that, in the in the like, early twenty, like at the turn of the century, we, the, the the green building turned into kind of a green building movement in terms of a broader view on this. Not only solar, but more sustainability. More factors came in, and then this became really popular. And it, at a certain point, it seemed to be a trend. Like you know, sometimes there are trends in architecture, it's like the, the green architecture movement, and. Then within this, it showed that there's a lot of so-called sustainable buildings where it wasn't really possible to see the language of sustainable architecture, like the form language. And uh, similar to uh, the impact of construction methods on form, there was not such a significant factor how you can determine whether this building is sustainable. Uh, if you have a lead platinum building, uh, a fully glazed tower in the middle of nowhere, which is lead platinum, people wonder what does sustainability have to do with form and architecture and uh, gestaltung. And so there are two questions related to this. Um, so th this is why I think uh, your topic is really relevant also for discussing architecture, communicating architecture and researching architecture. And I think it has to do something with the understanding of systems that so far it was not like it was a more monodimensional um, under approach of understanding systems in a more broad way, as you pointed out. It's, it's social, it's uh, energy, it's climate, it's nature. And I want to relate this to uh, not a bio biomimicry approach, but looking into natural systems. There is uh, this system approach called permaculture. Permaculture tries to understand the complexity of a natural system. And based off the understanding of this complexity, it can inform the landscape architect or the gardener how he can intervene with the system. And during the hypothesis that like, if buildings would be an infrastructural permaculture in an urban system, what would that mean if we would like uh, to 
really uh, have like a fundamental change in understanding this. What would that mean for the design team? What kind of capacity and what kind of working methods would we require to really create kind of an infrastructural permaculture? Or like, I mean, there's also the term of regenerative design, but I call it infrastructure permaculture because I like the idea of permaculture of really understanding what is going on in the systems and how can, how can we interact with these. So basically the long uh, question in short, in this utopia of creating these buildings, which interact with the urban, the neighborhood, the biodiversity, the nature, the climate, the human, as a productive part of this, what does it mean for the process? Are we capable as conventional design teams to produce these in a conventional design process? Or what else is needed to support this? Um. Yeah, and I, um, I, one of the things that we do in the studio um, is examine the role of policy um, and uh, policy as an ecosystem in which we operate. Um, so we don't make decisions simply because we think they're a great idea, but we make decisions because we have to. Um, and very, very often policy defines what we have to do. Um, and I, I, and, and one of the things that we did um, in, in dissecting all these projects is to look at how policy can become the driver of systems thinking. Because this cannot happen necessarily bottom up. Uh, even though we talk about the idea of aggregation, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if every building was to do a little something, but that's utopic, you know, it cannot happen spontaneously, organically. It requires some kind of um, a DNA to be embedded in the city so that the city organically changes over time. It's just like Hong Kong, they had this rule that said that if you connect to the next building, we give you extra floor space. And because of that DNA of policy, the city begins to transform over time. So I, I think the missing ingredient here is policy of how can we get policy to be more intelligent, um, to make, to create the, um, the, um, the triggers of change. Because what we're really talking about is about how change happens. Um, it's, it's fantastic to say, here is a better building, let me build it. But how do you change a city? And a city is a much more complex, um, uh, a time sensitive organism. And so to do that, you have to go into the DNA. So I honestly think it's a question of policy. I think that um, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Korea, they have very interesting policies that affect the way um, the obligation of the building to the city. So in many places, the building is seen to be the God-given right of the owner. You know, you pay some money to buy the, the piece of land, you can do whatever nonsense you want on it, as long as you have the money to waste, you can waste. But in, in many of these cities, they have begun to say, uh, no, <laughs> um, you have an obligation to the commons, to the collective. Uh, and that obligation requires you to do something. I, I think that they don't do enough. They don't force buildings to do enough. And for, uh, for Mansam and myself, the studios that we have uh, carried out suggest that the potential of this idea is exponential. It can be fundamentally transformative. So, you know, back to the question that Wolfgang asked earlier, if it's such a great idea, why aren't we doing it? Um, well, we've been trying to show our work to politicians and, and people in Singapore to get them to see a different kind of a future. Um, but it's very difficult. It's very difficult to, you know, and the argument we make is that, hey, we're not talking about charity. If you get every building to do their part, maybe you can build one less power plant in the next 10 years. That is money that you save 
uh, of, of government spending, you know. Um, so we should look at this as a larger picture of how much money do you spend here versus how much money do you save there? Um, and the only way to do that is policy. I, I, I really think that that is the ticket, especially in Asia. I, I, I say this because I feel culturally we are bound to um, uh, the idea that we need to be told what to do. Um, otherwise, capitalism runs amok, you know, uh, it just, it just goes wild. Um, and I, I do feel that we need that. The DNA of policy. Thank you. I absolutely agree. I think also the energy transformation in Germany was mainly driven by policy. I mean, we have to admit that this is a driving factor. Okay. I would like to uh, thank the audience and especially I would like to thank Nirmal to prepare like this the lecture on the form imperative, like the first lecture he gave on this on this topic. Uh, we are really honored uh, that you share your thoughts on this. And I would like to hand over now uh, to Vladislav, uh, the organizer of the lecture series, and also would like to thank uh, the IOSD to organize uh, the lecture series. I think it's super helpful. And we see in the audience that we have a very global audience, which means that the topic is a global topic. And uh, it's, it's a very productive session, bringing knowledge in all over uh, on a global scale, normal, <laughs> not only to Germany, but to uh, South America, Europe and uh, our countries. So thank you very much. And I hand over to Vladislav. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nirmal. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, I, I really appreciate that we uh, ended up a discussion with the uh, emphasis on the big picture. I think it's very important because I had this question actually also in my mind. What about the strategic more like policy level? So I, I really appreciate that we had such a comprehensive conversation with particular examples, so then also with the mention of, of the uh, of, this, of the importance of the policy level. Before saying uh, uh, goodbye to the wonderful audience and a speaker we had today, I'd like to uh, remind that uh, the IOD, uh, ISD lectures will come back after the Christmas and New Year break. So uh, you are very welcome to attend our uh, upcoming events. In particular, we have two in January, actually the last two in this semester. Uh, a talk uh, thinking ecologi ecologically about Indian cities by Professor Dr. Harini Nagendra from India, uh, which is scheduled for January 14th, 2021. Oh. And the following one, uh, which is on the role of the United Nations in promoting urban planning for sustainable development by uh, Rafael Tutz on January 20th, 2021. So I hope to see you all uh, again after the, uh, the break. And I sincerely wish you a great Christmas uh, holidays and all the best. Stay healthy. Thank you for being with us today. Thank Bye. you, Vladislav. <laughs> Thank you, Matthias.